Amen. Good morning. Let's all stand. We're going to open our service in prayer. And it is good to have you here today. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for today, another day of life. Thank you for the blessing of being able to know you and walk with you. Thank you for those that are joining us here. Thank you for those that are on the way. Bring them here safely, please. Thank you for those that are in the back. And thank you for those that are joining us online. Father, it is a privilege to walk with you day by day. It is a privilege to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to have sins forgiven. And I pray that you would accept our worship today, that it would be, as Charlie just said uh, in our Bible study, that it would be a sweet savor unto you, that you would accept our worship and that it would bring glory and honor to your name. And so we ask you to bless every aspect of our service. And we pray, pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn 389. My faith is found a resting place. We'll sing all four verses of hymn 389. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Hymn 389 on verse 2. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. Hymn 389 on the last verse. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being here today. And a couple announcements. I want to remind you to turn your uh, cell phone off or your ringer. Uh, put it on vibrate if you do not mind. That would be a blessing. And um, real quickly, take care of some business. Within uh, two weeks ago or last week, not this last week, but the week before that, Somebody either texted me or emailed me or messaged me or there's so many ways to communicate these days. It is overwhelming. So I forget whether it was a text, an email, a message or any one of these ways. But apparently, not last Sunday, but I think it was the Sunday before that, one of, our, one of the sermons, whether it was sermon audio, Facebook or YouTube, uh, the message was mixed up. I don't know if it was like the morning message was uploaded as the evening message or the evening message was uploaded as the morning message. And somebody texted me that. And I said, oh, great, I'll get to that right away. And then I forgot which one it was. And then when I went, went to look for that message, I could not find it. And um, I really don't want the wrong message to be uploaded, you know, one message as another. So whoever, if you're out there, whoever you were that sent me that message, could you please send that to me again? Um, 
please, I, I, you know, I appreciate, I appreciate those heads ups when that happens. Um, but again, there's, there are so many ways to communicate. It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, so please do that. Thank you for that, by the way. All right. Um, we don't have any first time visitors that I see at least now. So the last Sunday in this month, the last Sunday of June, which is June 30th, uh, we are going to do something special that we only do a couple times a year. We are going to have our, our morning services, the Bible study, at 930. By the way, I want to invite you to come to our Bible study. It is a, it's an adult Bible study. And uh, what we do is we, uh, Charlie's going through 2 Corinthians. It's just a study of the Bible verse by verse. And it's different than the morning service where we just preach and exhort. Uh, it is a, you know, feedback. He, he goes through the Bible, uh, answers questions, takes questions. It's a different format, and it's very, very helpful. Uh, so, he's, again, he's going through 2 Corinthians next week. At, at, it starts at 9.30 every Sunday morning. Um, next week we're starting uh, at chapter 2, I think it is, of 2 Corinthians. So we invite you to come. But on June 30th, we're going to start with the Bible study. Then we move into the morning service. Then we're going to have a light fellowship, finger food fellowship. Everybody brings whatever you want. Uh, are we moving into soup and chili? No, this is the hot time of year. So it's just going to be a light finger food fellowship. And then what we're going to do is move into a panel discussion. We're going to have our deacons uh, and pastoral staff sit up here. And we're going to answer questions. We already have a couple questions submitted, some good questions. And uh, we may even take questions from the the, the congregation. And we're going to uh, also open it up if you follow up questions. And um, that has gone really well. That has been a blessing. So that's going to be after our finger food fellowship. And then, and then we'll close the day with that panel discussion. And we will not have an evening service on June 30th. So we'd love for you to be able to do that if you can fit that in on June 30th. Stick around for the whole morning and early afternoon, and then we'll close the day with that. That's been a real blessing. So that's June 30th. And then if you can plan, put this on your calendar, September 1st through September 4th. That's Sunday through Wednesday. We are having Evangelist Morris Gleiser with us. So it'll be all day Sunday, the normal services, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock at night, we're going to have Evangelist Morris Glacier, and uh, it is going to be a blessing. We're going we're gonna to make up flyers. We're going to you know, get the word out. We're not sure whether it's going to be just like an evangelistic services or revival services or family meetings. Uh, I'm going to talk to Brother Glacier about that, but please be praying already for that. Put that on your calendar. Plan to invite people. You will be blessed. Morris Gleiser is a, a, very, um, a very popular, very gifted individual. He's very popular at the Wilds Christian Camp. Uh, he's a, he especially makes a great connection with teens. Uh, and he's just a, a dear brother in the Lord. God has used him mightily. So we hope that you can join us uh, for that time. Uh, September 1st through September 4th. Looking forward to that. All right, we're going to have our offering. If you men will come. And we're going to give our offering to the Lord. And uh, Gore, could you just step forward right there and just lead us in prayer for the offering nice and loud so they can hear it way up here, okay? Thank you. Amen. Thank you.
and thank you very much, Jane. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Philippians chapter 4. And I want to say congratulations to all of our graduates and those that have just finished another year of school. And I would start naming graduates, but I know that I'd leave some out. And some people have, like, finished a certain year, maybe didn't graduate, but it's a significant year. So just congratulations to everybody. Okay, how's that? All right, let's uh, get to Philippians chapter 4, and let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Our text this morning, we're going to look at two verses, verse 4 and verse 5, but I'll read beginning in verse 1 uh, to get the context of uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. Paul says, Therefore, my dearly, my brethren dearly beloved, and longed for, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodias, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. May God bless his word. Please bow with me in prayer. Our God, we thank you today for the exhortation that is in the scriptures. And I pray that you would help us uh, to first understand uh, what Paul is exhorting these believers to do and then to assimilate it into our lives so that we might be obedient to this exhortation, so that we might understand what exactly it is that you require of us, so that we might be able to understand how to do it, so that our lives might be better, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by your enabling grace, we might rejoice in the Lord always that we might let our moderation be known unto all men, keeping in mind the things that Paul exhorted these believers so long ago. And Father, I ask your blessing, and I thank you so much for the flock here, for uh, your people. I pray that you would enable me and help me to equip the saints. Thank you so much, Father, for the blessings of last week and those three that were baptized. We just praise you for that, for Andrew and for Lisa and for Serena. We do pray for Serena as she uh, heads out and and travels. Just bless her and protect her. And uh, for for Lisa and and Andrew, Lord, I pray for them, that you'd bless them. Thank you for the stand these three young people took and uh, enable them, Lord, to go off and do mighty things for you as they uh, carry on in their Christian walk. And uh, strengthen them, Lord. Help them to get grounded in the faith. And we pray that we would see many more saved and many more baptized and glorify you. And we just ask your blessing now on the word in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And you may be seated. And let's take our Bibles now, or no, our hymn books. Get the book right, Lion. And um, let's turn to hymn 564. 564, count your blessings. Three verses of 564. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, damn them one by one, And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, damn them one by one, Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Hymn 564 on verse 2. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. 
and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. That's it. Sorry, Jane. Three verses. Amen. All right. Let's open our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Thank you for being here today. We are on the last chapter. Of course, when Paul wrote this, there were no chapters. It was just one letter. And uh, we have uh, come to the point where he was actually wrapping things up. This is considered the conclusion uh, of his letter. And um, so he's, as he's wrapping it up, however, there's some really good meaty stuff in the conclusion of his letter. And as Paul would often wrap up his letters, like in Corinthians and Thess- uh, Thessalonians, he comes to the end and he, he does uh, what some have called staccato imperatives. He like gives these rapid fire advice for Christians where he just kind of scatter guns. He gives all these challenges. Does that in Thessalon- uh, Thessalonians? Does that in Corinthians? And he does it here too. And so uh, we're going to look at in chapter 4, uh, for example, just verses 4 and 5. What we're going to look at today is some, some quick little tidbits of exhortations that are very important. In fact, just what we look at today is advice that if we would follow it, if those Corinthian, uh, those uh, believers in Philippi, if they would follow it, they would be able to do what Paul has done and what Paul did in his letter, and what he is challenging them to do. You see, in Paul's letter, it's, a, it's only four chapters, it's a small letter, but remember, it's a prison epistle. Paul's in jail, he's under house arrest. He's awaiting a trial which could end in his death. And he didn't do anything wrong, he's preaching the gospel. And he knows he could die for this. We've already been through that in in the earlier chapters. He says, you know, I might die. I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to abide and remain with you is more needful. He wanted to be with Christ, but, you know, he didn't know what was going to happen. He's talking about his imprisonment. He knows that the Philippians are very burdened and concerned because they're also uh, being persecuted because of the persecution against Christians. He's in prison, but he's, you know, thinking positive. He says, I want you to know that the things that have happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. And this theme pops up throughout this letter. In fact, he mentions this one thing 11 times. And we find it twice in just one verse, verse 4. This idea of rejoicing. Look at verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And then for emphasis, he says, Again, I say, rejoice. It is a command. He's exhorting these believers. He says, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. All the time. And then if I, to repeat it, he says, again, I say, rejoice 
And then the next verse may sound like something totally different. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But it actually stems from this idea of rejoicing in the Lord at all times. If they can do that, they will be able to do what Paul did. Because Paul rejoiced in the Lord always. In fact, I'm going to go back for a few minutes or just go over his whole letter because he mentions the idea of rejoicing 11 times. Let, let me just scan it. In chapter 1 and verse 18, he mentioned the fact that he was uh, that preaching the gospel, there were some people that preached for the right motives. His imprisonment gave some people the opportunity to preach the gospel to help him, and then other people preached the gospel to add affliction to his. And he said this, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, in other words, talking about the motives of some people to preach the gospel, he said, no matter what, Christ is preached, and I therein rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So Paul's, Paul's rejoicing no matter what, because the gospel is being preached. And then in chapter 2 and verse 16, he just told them, do all things without murmurings or disputings. And then he says, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. And then in verse 17 he says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, in other words, if I die for my service to you, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. This guy is rejoicing during things that most people would complain and want to give up. Then in chapter 2, in verse 28, he's talking about sending Epaphroditus. And he says, I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. I mean, this guy's just talking all about rejoicing. And then Philippians chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then in verse 3, he says, we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ. And in that text context, he's talking about boasting, not, and remember, he gave all the things he used to boast in. Being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day, a Pharisee, he was given all his credentials. And he's saying, I count all those things dung, and I now just boast in Jesus Christ. And now we get to the verse today, verse 4 and 5. He's challenging them, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. So look, we're going to look at three things this morning. And if you and I can get these things into our lives, if you and I can do these things, you and I will succeed in being able to do what Paul did and rejoice in the Lord always. Let's pray first. Father, thank you for this thing that Paul seemed to grasp effortlessly. He was able to rejoice in you no matter what. Father, we want to do that. We want to be able to rejoice in you at all times. Whether we're in prison facing death, no matter what's going on, whether we're being deprived, or whatever, we want to be able to rejoice in the Lord. Lord, teach us what that means and help us. Help us to obey and understand what we are being exhorted to do today in this text. Two verses. We pray the Spirit of God would illuminate us and bless us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Three things. Here's the outline. Number one, is the challenge to rejoice in the Lord simply an empty command you know, like, smile and be happy. You know, grin and bear it. Or is it a key concept once you understand what Paul is after? Then uh, the second point, which is verse 5, it's impact on others. In other words, if we can get this concept in verse 4, then we will be able to do what verse 5 says. And by the way, there's a there's an old English word in verse 5 that you've got to understand or it's going to confuse you. And then the second part of verse 5 is point 3, 
with, which is kind of like the culminating glory, the crowning glory of being able to rejoice in the Lord. So let's jump in. Look at verse 4, Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And for repeat effect, he says, again I say, rejoice. What does it mean to rejoice? Well, we looked up the word. I looked up the word. I don't know if you did. I did. And the word rejoice means this. To feel joy or delight. That's the very root word, the root meaning of to rejoice. It is to feel joy or delight. Now, whenever we talk about something that has to do with feeling something, it can be a problem. Because we don't control our feelings, do we? I can't control how I feel. So I looked up, you know, what, what are feelings? Feeling. If we, because Paul's, is Paul commanding us to feel a certain way? Because some days I wake up, I feel good. Some days I wake up and I don't feel good. What's he, what is he getting at? So I looked up the word feeling. Listen to what feeling is. Feeling is to have a sensation, impression, perception, or emotion. And, and I thought, well, wait a minute. Is Paul like saying, don't worry, be happy? You know, that's, is that what he's saying? Just, you know, I mean, I remember... When we started going to, when I first got saved, my wife and I, my girlfriend at the time got saved. We started going to Bible Baptist, uh, uh, like our first, where we started, we landed at our first gospel preaching church. And then we started witnessing to family. And we witnessed to Mary's parents, Ed and Joanne, who ended up getting saved. But at first, I remember Joanne, who you're all praying for, she came to, to Westchester to, to the church we were going to. And, and her first response was, suspicion she's like everybody's smiling there's something wrong here you know <laughs> like what's everybody smiling for she was real suspicious about that you know because you know you're just, it just wasn't really natural like what's everybody smiling for and, and is this what Paul is saying you know, and it reminds me, I've talked about this before. There's a documentary, which is like a slander mentry about a particular Christian family that is, is kind of looked as, as a freak because they have a lot of kids and it's shiny, happy people. Like, you know, there's, there's, a, really, there's a real slander against, you know, this whole idea of, um, oh, you know, shiny, happy people and you, you smile a lot. You're, you know, oh, these Christians. Is that what Paul's saying to do? Just smile and be happy. Rejoice in the Lord. Is that what he's saying? He, you know, if, if the definition of to rejoice in the Lord is to feel joy or delight, is he commanding us just be plastic, people? Is that what he's saying? No. So I looked up the word joy. Joy is a vivid emotion of pleasure arising from a sense of well-being or satisfaction. It is the feeling or state of being highly pleased or delighted. Exultation of spirit, gladness, delight. So what is Paul really getting after when we are, because we, would you not agree this is a command? He's commanding the believers in Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. He is. I submit to you. This is not synonymous with don't worry, be happy, grin and bear it, just pretend, put on a shiny happy face and pretend there are no problems. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that there is a possibility for us to rise above our circumstances and be satisfied with something outside of our experiences. It's called the joy of the Lord. Notice, he's not saying rejoice in your circumstances. 
Because if we had to respond to our circumstances, they'd be up, they'd be down, right? What is he commanding? He is commanding us to rejoice in our mood? No. He's challenging us to rejoice in the Lord. And that is everything. That is everything. So I looked up the word rejoice. And as, as I usually do, I did a word study and I studied the history of the word. What's called the etymology. And it, it's really interesting. When you study the history of this word, it goes back to another word which really gives incredible insight on the history of the word. The word rejoice goes back, the early English goes back to the root word of to own, like goods and property. And so it speaks of to enjoy the possession of, to have the fruition of. And here's the example. And this, this goes back to the 1300s. To have someone as a husband or a wife. To have for oneself and to enjoy. In other words, you've heard of to enjoy the fruits of your labor. That's where, that's where this idea of rejoice is connected to. To enjoy. Think about this. What we are being commanded to do when it says rejoice in the Lord is to enjoy the Lord. That's what we're being told to do. It reminds me of 1 Timothy 6.17. Paul says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded or trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Do you realize that God does not want us to trust in and to enjoy the things of this world more than He wants us to trust in and enjoy Him. See, when we rejoice in the Lord, we are delighting in and enjoying Him. And that's the key to us rejoicing in the Lord. It's the key. And it goes back to what Paul said in this very letter in chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul said, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. That's what Paul's after. Paul said, I want to enjoy Jesus Christ. And folks, if you and I, if we, when we rejoice in Him, that, is, that brings a feeling of joy and delight even when we are suffering. It reminds me of when we talk about feelings. When you are injured, when, when something hurts you and you apply a salve or a balm to it, and we often talk about Jesus, there's a phrase, the balm of Gilead. Your wound hurts, doesn't it? But when you apply an ointment, there's a good feeling to that, isn't it? Isn't there? So when you and I are experiencing pain, the idea of rejoicing in the Lord, the idea of enjoying the Lord is that there is comfort that comes. Not that we're denying the pain, but as we delight, as we enjoy Him, that ministry comforts us and helps us and that's rejoicing in the Lord. It's not denying the hard times. It's not, you know, smile and be happy and shiny and just ignore your pain. It's not. But it is allowing Him to minister to us. And that, in a sense, when you think of what rejoice, remember what the basic definition of rejoice is? To feel joy or delight. And we can do that in the midst of pain. We can rejoice in sorrow. We can rejoice while grieving. We're still sad. We're still hurting. We're still struggling. But 
we have that, that wound, the ointment ministered to us. And so when Paul tells us, rejoice in the Lord always, he's telling us, he's not saying, you know, just smile and be happy and pretend nothing's wrong. He's not saying that. He's saying, let Jesus Christ be your rock. Enjoy the Lord. Go to Him. Flee to Him. Let Him be your balm of Gilead. Let Him, let him heal you. Just focus on Him. Rejoice, not in your circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord. There's a famous lawyer, or actually a famous Supreme Court Justice, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, who was a judge for 30 years on the Supreme Court. You've probably heard of him, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And uh, he was known for his mind, his wit, and his work. Earned him the official title of the greatest justice since John Marshall. And at one point in his life, he explained his choice of a career. Why did you choose to be a judge? And he said this. He said, I would have, I, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen that I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Isn't that sad? Here's a, you know, here he is, he's a young guy, and he considered going into ministry. But the ministers that he knew look like undertakers. What a sad thing, isn't it? They look like morticians. They look like death. I mean, that is such a rebuke. Is it not? I think it is. I was reading a biography of, uh, of um, James Stewart, King James the Sixth and the First, who the King James Bible is named after. And they were talking about the Puritans. And one guy's perspective was that the Puritans... Um, their life, some of them, their biggest fear of, of certain Puritans was that someone somewhere might be having a good time. I mean, is that sad? I mean, it is sad. But I think of this justice like his reason for not going into ministry was that all the preachers he knew looked like undertakers. That is a rebuke. Ministers, Christians... They should be the, the most joyful, should they not? We should, we should have, what the, in fact, um, I love this, David. David was at a lowest point in his life because his own army spoke of stoning him. And you know what the Bible says? David encouraged himself in the Lord. There was nothing to encourage him in his circumstances. But David was able to rejoice in the Lord. He was able to enjoy the Lord and encourage himself in the Lord. Nehemiah, at a low point in his life, the Bible, he challenged in a low point in, in the Jews' life when they were going back into the promised land to rebuild. Nehemiah challenged the people and he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Folks, you and I, if we're going to be able to rejoice in the Lord, we have to be able to enjoy Him. And that gives us joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy is the second one. Peace. I mean, we, we should have the joy of the Lord. Again, it doesn't mean that we're denying reality. It doesn't mean we're putting on a plastic smile and pretending to be something we're not. But it means that when we are going through difficult times, we can be sustained because we have the rock that is higher than I. There is a hymn. There's a couple hymns actually that are a big blessing. One of the hymns is the Lily of the Valley. Listen to some of the words of this. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000. The, the word fairest is an old English word which literally means to a beauty or attractiveness. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. 
In sorrow, he's my comfort. In trouble, he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. And the whole hymn goes through that. Like, we have this wonderful friend in Jesus. There's another song called Fairest Lord Jesus. There's so many songs about how you and I can fall in love with Jesus. You see, rejoicing in the Lord means that we have the ability to feel joy and delight in Jesus. Remember the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2? They, they were really commended by the Lord in the letters to the seven churches because they worked hard, they were faithful, they labored and they were patient. They did not quit or faint. But the Lord had something against them. They left their first love. They left their first love. So they were diligent in their labor. They didn't quit. But they lost something. They lost that love of the Lord. They stopped delighting in Him. And that is a danger for us. Let's move on to the the next challenge. And that's when you and I do delight in the Lord. It's impact on others. Look at verse 5. This is a challenge. We're probably going to end here just that last little phrase we might not get to. But look at verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Now, as we look at the King James Version, it's important for us to realize that it is over 400 years old. It's Old English. And uh, there's a guy out there named Dr. Mark Ward who has a book called Authorized. And he brings out a very important point, which some people aren't acknowledging. But, in fact, the, the preface to the King James Version points this out so articulately and so clearly. And we've been going over this in our Bible study as we've been talking about hermeneutics. There are, when you talk about any language that sticks around for a while, there are words that become dead words. And there are some words in the King James Version that have become dead words. But you know them right away. For example, there are words like um, besom. Like if you came, if you're reading your Bible and you came across the word besom, you would say, what on earth is besom? Right? It is a dead word. It's no longer used. Um, I have a whole list here and I can't find it on my notes. Besom... Where's Beesom? Beesom, Beesom, Beesom. Beeves. Um, Neesings. Ambassage. These are all words that are in the King James. When you read that and you say, I never heard of that. You know it's a dead word. So what do you do? You look it up. Or you might have, there's several Bibles, like I have a defined study Bible, and it gives you the definitions. A Cambridge, a couple other Bibles give you those those dead words, and they tell you what they are. And, And so that's easy. But... Here's Mark Ward's point. There are words that are called false friends. In other words, they are not obsolete words, but they have changed in meaning. So you might just read over them, and because it's a word that's still in use today, you might think that it's the the use that it is today. For example, look at verse 5, the word moderation, we still use it today, don't we? But, so, so here's his point. He says this very articulately. There are words that we know that we don't, want, that we don't know, like besom and beeves and all that. We know that we don't know them. Those are dead words. But there are false friends. That's, there's words that we don't know that we don't know. Right? And that's like moderation. So moderation is still being used today, but it's changed. So when you look at let your moderation be known unto all men, today's meaning is totally different than it was 400 years ago. And that's important. Let me give you what it means today, what you already know. And I'm going to go to the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, which is the most extensive dictionary in the English language. And it... First, it says what it originally meant. I'll give you that in a minute. But it says later, more generally, the word moderation means the quality of being moderate in conduct, avoiding excess or extremes. That's what it means today, right? You might have heard this. Do all things in moderation. 
And by the way, that is not a Bible verse. Some people might say, of course it is. It's right here in Philippians 4 or 5. No. When, when this was translated, that is not what it meant. Here's what it meant. And the Oxford English Dictionary says, originally, here's what the word meant. The quality of being moderate in harshness or intensity, mildness or clemency. Clemency means mercy. And then it says next to it, obsolete. We do not use the word moderation the way the King James translators used it when it first came out. Now in the Defined Study Bible, it, it puts down here gentleness, mildness, fairness. That's how it was used. So that's what this verse is challenging us. Not in moderation. It's saying it, what is challenging us, let your moderation or let your fairness, let your gentleness, let your meekness, let your mercy be known unto all men. And it has everything to do with you and I rejoicing in the Lord. You and I um, being satisfied. You and I um, focusing on our relationship with the Lord. When you and I content ourselves with Jesus Christ, it will affect how we respond to other people in a big way. And so these two, these two verses are very much connected. When we delight in the Lord, when we enjoy our relationship with Jesus Christ, it very much affects how we respond to people. In fact, they will see our gentleness, our mercy. In fact, let me show you this. There's a, the, the Greek word that is translated um, moderation is used four other times in the Scriptures. And so listen to how the King James translators translated the other time. No other time in the New Testament did they translate this Greek word moderation. And real quickly, um, 1 Timothy 3.3 3. Uh, qualifications for a pastor, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. That's, a, that's the same Greek word that they translated moderation. Titus 3.2, urging elders, speak evil of no man to be no brawlers, but gentle. That's the word that's translated moderation. James 3.17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. That's how they translated the word. Um, 1 Peter 2.18, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle. That's, so you get the idea. It's, it's the same word. So when Paul tells the believers in Philippi to let your moderation be known unto all men, he's challenging them, let people see that you are merciful, that you are gentle. Let them see it. Let all men see it. How are they going to do that? Only if you are enjoying the Lord, if you are rejoicing in the Lord, it is going to affect the way you respond to other people. I want to show a few verses here. Um, turn to James chapter 2 and verse 13, because this is over, uh, this is so clear in the scriptures. In fact, one commentator was, in fact, let me give you the definition of um, the Greek word that's translated moderation here. Uh, it is not insisting on every right or letter of law or custom. Another word could be yielding. So the, the idea of moderation, let your moderation be known to all men. Let people see that you can yield to others, that you're gentle, that you're merciful, that you're patient. Remember the other terms. James chapter 2 and verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath shown no mercy. Mercy rejoiceth against judgment. You keep in mind. In fact, Jesus, Jesus shared this same principle in Matthew chapter 7 and verse, verses 1 through 5. By the way, Matthew 7, 1 is probably one of the most famous verses that every unsaved person knows if they know any Bible. Judge not that you be not judged, right? Nobody, everyone loves that verse. And they take it out of context. They say, oh, you're not supposed to judge. Like, all judging is wrong. It is not saying that. 
Look what it says. In fact, look, it, that's what verse 1 is. Judge not that you be not judged. But look at verse 2. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote, that's the splinter, out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam, a, a large joist, is in your own eye. Thou hypocrite, here's the key, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote or the splinter out of thy brother's eye. He's not condemning judging. He's condemning hypocritical judging. That's what he's condemning when he says judge not. He's not saying all judging is wrong. He is saying hypocritical judging is wrong. Keep that in mind. So going back to Matthew or to Philippians 4, 5. If you and I are going to let our moderation be known unto all men, we will not do that unless we are rejoicing in the person of Jesus Christ. Only when we enjoy Him are we going to have that proper balance, that proper gentleness with others. It's the only way we're going to do that. Because that's when we have a healthy perspective of our own sin, as Jesus demonstrated. You know, I'm very conscious of um, the fact that uh, there's a saying that I become more conscious of. Have you ever heard of people that take their work home with them? And, and I don't mean in like the COVID-19. Now people are really taking their work home with them and they're working from home. And I don't mean that way. But the way that used to be is like people would bring their problems home with them uh, and maybe they would ha if they had a problem at, at work with a the boss they would take it out on their wife or take it out on their kids that idea of bringing their work home with them and and we've seen that happen haven't we where people will take things out on their family because they they can't leave their work at home or they can't leave their work at work and 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 that idea that they're being harsh. They're taking things out on others is exactly what this verse is, is against. Let your moderation be known unto all men. They're being harsh on people they should not be harsh on. And that can be a real danger. That's what Paul's rebuking against. And the key to that, folks, goes back to verse 4. When you and I learn how to rejoice in the Lord, again, what's that mean? To enjoy the Lord. The further we get away from letting the joy of the Lord be our strength, the further we get away from encouraging ourselves in the Lord, from just enjoying His presence, the harsher we are going to be to those we love. And we won't even realize it. We won't even realize it. And, and I close with this last part, is the crown and glory. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And this is an Aramaic. Remember they spoke, the New Testament, they, they, the New Testament is written in Greek. But what they spoke, we, we went over this too recently in our Bible study when we were looking at um, Jesus' teaching to Peter, do you love me? They spoke in Aramaic. And this was apparently a phrase that was very common during that first century. The phrase Maranatha, the Lord is coming, the Lord comes. And apparently it was a phrase that was very common in that first century church to remind one another that the Lord is coming. And it was, it was very important to them that they would remind one another. It, it was quoted in 1 Corinthians 16.22. And many believe that this was, that Paul was telling them the Lord is at hand. And this goes hand in hand. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation, let your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. A week or two ago, we went to Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Remember that? Not everyone was prepared, and then the bridegroom came, and those who were not prepared missed out. Why was Paul saying the Lord is at hand? 
Because that's the key. Preparedness. For you and I to realize the Lord could come back today. That preparedness, that vigilance is something we must never forget. If Jesus came back today or He called us home today, are we prepared? See how sad it will be if the Lord calls us home today and we're not rejoicing in Him. And we have forgotten Him. We've put Him on the shelf. We've stopped loving Him. We became like the church in Ephesus. And we, lost our, we left our first love. And then there He is. Oh, that's right. Oh Lord, I forgot You. I got so distracted. I was doing all this other stuff. Can I just have five more minutes? He's not going to give us five more minutes. He's not going to give us five more minutes. But now, he might, He'll give us five more minutes. Now we might have even a couple years if we decide, I'm going to put the Lord first. He's, he's given us time, isn't He? Every sermon, every time you open your Bible, every time you listen to a, a gospel message, or every time you, you see a scripture verse, it's the Lord saying, you've got time. Put me first. Put me first. Get on your knees Put me first. Rejoice in the Lord. It's not too late right now. Let's rejoice in the Lord. What did Paul say? Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let's enjoy Him. Please pray with me. Father, You are so worthy. Our precious Savior. He is the lily of the valley. He is the greatest friend we could ever have. He is the fairest Lord Jesus, the beautiful, the most attractive. We just, we love Him. We pray, Father, that You would draw us near to Him. We have the the precious privilege of calling Him Abba, Father, of calling You Abba, Father, and, and of loving Him calling Him our friend. And Father, we would ask You today that if we have gotten sidetracked, if we have forgotten that precious one, that lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, that You would stir up our passion for You, that You would revive us again, that we would love You deeply. Father, if we've gotten sidetracked and we've gotten our priorities out of whack, maybe there's some people that have brought their work home with them or brought their trials and allowed them to distract them from the people that mean the most to them. The Father, we would do whatever it would take. You are so good to us. The Father, you've given us second chances and third chances and fourth chances. I pray that we would take advantage of them. And Lord, that we would change. You are the God of second and third chances. But Lord, that we would not frivol them, allow them to be frittered away. And Lord, thank You for Your mercy. Help us to rejoice in You. Help us to enjoy our precious Savior. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's all stand. Please take your hymn books out. We will close with hymn 665. 665, Stand Up for Jesus. And we'll sing all four verses of 665. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high His royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, His army shall He lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict 
in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise to danger, to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcometh a crown of life will be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Okay, on Tuesday, I had the privilege to introduce for the first time Glenn and Curly Maxwell. Today is the second time I get to introduce you to Glenn and Curly Maxwell. Make sure you congratulate them, okay? You're dismissed. <laughs> Yes. Oh. <laughs>